Okay, hello. Thank you for joining us uh, this midday in California and this evening in Zurich, where our guest Tosh Basco is joining us from. Uh, this is a presentation of the Department of Visual Arts speaker series, and the Department of Theater and Dance uh, has co-sponsored this program with us as a part of their Moving in the World speaker series. And we are uh, doing this talk with the support of a lot of staff and faculty in both departments that I want to thank. I'm Malik Gaines. I'm an associate professor in visual arts, and I'm here to welcome Tosh Basco. And let me do a brief bio here. Tosh Basco was born in California and began working in the drag scene in San Francisco in the 2010s. Um, uh, Basco's photography and drawing practice accompany a lot of performance work. Uh, much of which has prominently be done, been done under the name of Boy Child. And uh, Tosh is a co-founder of uh, Moved by the Motion with Wu Tsang and has presented uh, performance media and interdisciplinary work in really interesting and impressive venues all over the world, including the Venice Biennial, the Whitney Museum, and the uh, Schauspielhaus Zurich. Um, among many others. Uh, I saw Tosh last year in the film Moby Dick, uh, directed by Wu Tsang, where if I were on the Oscar nominating committee, that would be my choice for best uh, actor, actress across the board, all of it. <laughs> um, and the it, it's you know a stunning performance, and also Tosh did. Um, incredible choreography for that film. And it's just one example of a really uh, large body of work that's really uh, been a pleasure to watch over the last several years. Um, uh, Tosh is going to speak to us about this work. So I am going to turn it over and return at the end for a little bit of Q&A. OK, thank you so much, Tosh. Thank you. Malik for the introduction. Um, yeah, and thank you to both the visual arts department and um, as well as the dance and theater department for having me. Um, I think I, I mean, that was a pretty good introduction. I think I would just say that um, it, it makes a lot of sense for, uh, me to give a talk to both departments because my work actually it spans a lot of um, mediums and medias and genres. Um, I currently am working at the Schauspielhaus in Zurich which is um, a state theater in Switzerland um, making works predominantly with my collaborative group moved by the motion. Um, and I'm actually glad that we're doing this talk now because I'm in the process of doing my first museum show, which, um, yeah, I, yeah, I think it's, I'm in a grand state of uh, confusion, which is one of the many stages of my process. And yeah, I think, for the show, I'm trying to situate both my performance practice um, and my visual arts practice in in one in one building. So, thinking about the drawings um, that I think of as kind of transcriptions of movement with photographs, which I don't know. I've been trying for many years to kind of conceive and conceptualize uh into one practice but making sense of that has been um yeah quite difficult so um yeah so let's see where should we begin i'm going to share my screen quick time yeah. okay um so where do i begin 
I think, um, yeah, I'm gonna do a little improv here. Because that's my thing. I hope you guys can bear with me. Um, let's see here. Where to begin? Where to begin? Beginnings are always quite funny, I think, because, um, you know, time is really fluid. And I don't know, I always think of things as kind of being entangled with other things, especially in time. Okay, we'll start here. So <clears throat> let's see. Open with preview. We'll do the full screen. Okay, so this is just, I think I'll start at the beginning, which, um, yeah, as Malik mentioned, I started doing drag performance um, the end of 2011 in San Francisco. And I started performing actually uh, because a friend of mine invited me to be in his performance. Um, and at the time I was mostly working through photography. Uh, I have kind of a, a love-hate relationship to photography, but it is really kind of the first place that I, I found a, a, as a creative outlet. Um, and so when my friend asked me to perform with him, I thought this is the most horrible idea ever. Um, but he, he uh, his name is Justin Kennedy. He's a dancer. And he was at the time somebody that I, one of the few people that I really felt um, safe with to dance, actually, which is funny because now that's what I do with my um, career. And so I thought, okay, I should really think about this invitation and think about what it means and take it seriously. So I used um, I used the drag bars that I was frequenting at the time um, to kind of see like what would happen if I were to go on stage, um, to put myself on kind of the other side of the lens. Um, you know, I, th I think of I think of photography as kind of being like. Uh, there's kind of a unidirectional gaze. I mean, that's not true. I would say that it cycles back and forth depending on what the subject is doing. But for me, it was really um, an opportunity to, I don't know, get on the other side of things. So, so what happened was a big surprise, which was that I basically something something in me ignited and um, I started to perform kind of as much as I could. Um, and the reason why I like to start with this place is because I'm now in the process of making, uh, I'm actually now in the process of making kind of paintings as well as drawings that, that really stem from improvisational movement. But that practice, it when you take it back, it 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 starts here. It starts with um, the lip sync, and it starts with I think the club as a as a central meeting point, um, like queer nightlife and and um, underground culture, like underground queer culture actually. So. <clears throat> um what did I want to say I think that um yeah I think what I'll do is start with a video um of one of my more recent performances that I did in 2022 and also I did in 2020. So this is the performance that I did. It was the last performance that I did before the pandemic. And it was the first performance that I kind of did um, on a large scale, not that, not that the pandemic is over, but um, kind of as things were starting to open again. Um, okay, let's see.
Okay. And then there was one other one I thought I would share. Um, Bye. Okay. So, um, this performance is called Untitled Duet. And it was staged at Martin Gropius Bau in Berlin. And um, yeah, what to say about this? I mean, somehow I think that this kind of performance is a good place to start because um, it encompasses, I, I think it's a, it encompasses kind of the nexus of what I do at, at the theater in the sense of like, it, it's quite theatrical, but it also, um, I would say it's a bit of a stretch, but it, it is it is very much related to um, this untitled series is, is pretty related to the lip sync. So um, untitled duet, it is, a performance that spans for over the course of two days, and it's in the atrium of Martin Gropius Bau, which, um, yeah, it's a it's a pretty big museum in Berlin, uh, big as in like literal the literal size of it. So I was thinking I performed here a few times in different capacities, and maybe I can revisit uh, another performance that I did there, but. It basically spanned two days. And the first time I did it, it was at five hours each time. And the second time I did it, it was three hours each time. And I kind of, um, I became inspired by this talk with um, Fred Moten and I believe Fernando Zalamea, who's a mathematician about, um, about um, Angelus Novus, which is a painting by Paul Clay. Actually, I think it's a print. And um, Fred situated it kind of as it's this angel of history. It, and it was Benjamin's, Walter Benjamin's favorite painting that he carried with him um, until his death. And um, Fred really situated the angel of history as kind of like thinking through through it as improvisation. Um, and actually I should read, sorry, I have to pull this up really quick. Um, sorry, you guys are like really getting the, the inside. Um, Angelus Novus. Okay, so this is the painting. And um, Clay kind of, yeah, he wrote about this painting um, in his thesis. So he wrote, his face is turned toward the past where we perceive a chain of events. He sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm, is irre the storm irresistibly propels him into the future which his back is turned while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. The storm is what we call progress. Um, and here, uh, yeah, so here Fred kind of situated this, this excerpt of Klee to, to talk about improvisation. Um, and so to go back to the beginnings of when I started drag, um, I would say that my performance practice, the way I try to kind of describe it in language to people, the one-liner is kind of like improvisational movement-based performance. Um, and 
I arrived at that through um, per, like learning how to perform in clubs. So I was learning in kind of like two minute or three minute fragments and of performances. And um, Vaginal Davis very aptly described my my movement based practice as being interpretive dance. And I think. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if anyone out there has notions about what interpretive dance is, but at the time I was kind of quite embarrassed by that. But I, I always think that um, over time, I kind of started to think that that was maybe the, the most appropriate description for the way that I um, have built my body of movement, which is really just like, when I started doing drag, I would basically use kind of, um, remixed songs um, to lip sync the lyrics. But over time, the lip sync as kind of like the literal moment where my mouth was lip syncing the words, it, it really, it very quickly expanded to um, incorporate my body. So the way that I conceive of lip sync in my practice is like, and through improvisation is really like, it's a way for me to engage um, actively in the present with, uh, at the time, you know, remix pop songs. So, uh, you know, also if I didn't like, if the words were illegible because they were being augmented so much that they no longer became legible words, then I would kind of help my body to communicate something that I felt in the sound, but that wasn't maybe um, coherent as language. So um, yeah, so over time, as I, as I did the lip syncs, they, which by the way, they were never called lip syncs until I started performing outside of the club in art context in which, um, you know, people started asking me for the titles of my performances and um, in order to help them kind of uh, understand what I was doing, I would call them untitled lip syncs so that it, it maybe helped, I'm not sure if it did, but maybe helps people to understand where it was coming from. Um, yeah, and so as I as I did these performances, learning through doing in the clubs and in in yeah, mostly clubs, but then kind of in different kinds of spaces. Um, I never somehow in the hundreds of performances, I I never really like repeated anything. Um, I I somehow found the spark of performance through improvisation. So my process at the time, and I would say very much still is really do, like doing the work to understand the text, which maybe in the beginning was the lyrics, or maybe even also you could think of it as like the score of the sound. And then further along the line, maybe more closer to the present or an untitled duet, the piece that I'm, I have on screen right now, it was really thinking about different texts. So Benny means text, um, Fred's reading of Benny means text. Um, I was also really thinking about um, Danielle Goldman's book. Oh man, I'm so sorry. I'm blanking right now on the title of her book, but she talks a lot about improvisation as a mode of survival. Um, and, and incorporating that in kind of like rules of engagement of, of the performance. So, um, I guess, I suppose this was quite literal in the sense that like in the space, um, which is a large atrium, I, I think it was maybe 50, maybe like 40 or 50 meters long, which is like, Oh, I don't know, 120, 100 feet long or something, um, 150 feet long, as kind of um, one side of the stage was kind of like the beginning of time, <laughs> I suppose, and the, the other end was uh, maybe moving toward the end of time. 
and I was conceiving of the spotlights as this um, visual metaphor for uh, sight and visibility, like what can be seen. And, and also thinking a lot about, um, I would say that actually a lot of my thinking right now in this, in this show for, um, that's coming up is, is, is also thinking about seeing, but thinking about visibility as this kind of, I think, um, I think that it can kind of be in sight in, in general and images and image and photographing and thinking about photographing through capture. So this light was kind of trying to embody these notions of sight as um, kind of an extension of, of thinking around like knowledge, if that makes sense. Um, photographs and sight kind of standing in as testaments for truth and likening that to maybe, um, you know, like the kind of enlightenment thinking of knowledge and truth and, and, and scientific um, research that's that that wants things to be quantifiable or something um and so together with josh johnson he's the other dancer in this piece we i don't know i kind of like thought about as like the the like in a the electrons dancing around and, and kind of disappearing in space and so over the course of five hours um or three hours depending on which which performance in 2020 or 2022 we would make our way from one end to the other um, with the spotlights kind of following us the entire time. And it was, it was kind of this really, you know, if you're thinking about it in, per, in, in within a theater context or a narrative context in, in theater, it would be kind of like an antagonistic force, which, um, which also, is really present, you know, these kinds of things that they, they, to me, they make a lot of sense to go back and forth because there's also, there's this kind of framework in theater of an antagonistic character or something or force, but there's also, I think, you know, in a lot of pop music, it might be the X or it might be um, the, the X's new person, but I feel like, <laughs> there are like the cops or there's also, there's like, um, I think there's also there's also the same kind of like interplay um, of like an antagonist or protagonist. Um, I wouldn't say that there's a protagonist in this performance, but I would say that the light is definitely an antagonistic force that um, that I had follow us for the entire five hours or three hours. Um, the decision to do that also, and the way of relating it to capitalism is thinking about the ways, uh, I don't know, for me, I, I kind of, I was kind of telling them like the light guys and also the way that I was framing, it was thinking about its chase as, um, I don't know, I guess I was thinking about the way that, about algorithms actually. And, uh, thinking about algorithms and how they kind of have this like exponential move toward infinity. So they kind of like replicate structure, but they'll never like, if you look at like an exponential curve, it will never touch, it will never like, it will start on one, on, on one line, but it will never touch the other end. And for me, that line that it will never touch is kind of like, uh, kind of like a horizon, I suppose. And, um, yeah, I have another video um, that I'll show you later, but yeah, I think this like line of the horizon and it kind of came from some previous works, but the thinking about this, this colonial impulse that I think is maybe like a little bit at the, not a little bit, I would say that it's at the root of capitalism, which is kind of like, you can never, touch something like you can never it will never cease basically um and 
Yeah, so that was that was the light. The other aspect of this performance that is really you can't see in the photos, obviously, but that is really um, was important to me is is the sound. So the sound was done by Ashlyn Mines, who uh, one of his DJ names was Total Freedom and Big Idiot DJ, and I think he, he actually maybe had just changed his DJ name again, but um he felt like the the perfect person to do the music because he is somebody that I performed to a lot in the beginning of my career but I think that he has this um really uncanny and remarkable ability to bring within one track um what I experienced to be as the like very complicated, chaotic um, sensation of being alive today, <laughs> if that makes sense. So like, like I think he has, yeah, he can within a song really like touch on to so many different um, feelings really and histories. And so I, I asked him if he would do this because I wanted the music to really think about the wind. If the storm is blowing from, from where is it blowing? And I asked him for the, I wanted the music to be kind of, because music, um, and I also learned this from doing doing drag and through the lip syncs. Music, it carries so much history, and to to remix it, to slow it down, to put it um, to remix something can really you can bring two two eras of time together. It can be a really um, deep conversation, and so. Um, so yeah, and, and I thought, I don't know that I would do this now, but at the time I thought that it was really the three of us making the performance and I, I, I wanted there to be kind of a pull against this notion of two. Um, so there are the two of us on stage, but there is also like the two, which is, um, this kind of like the on stage and the off stage so the components of the dancers and and Ashlyn stage who is really like at the um what would be like the beginning of of time like at the beginning of stage in opposition to the lights here's some photos this is Josh Johnson he's a part of move by the motion and is the best dancer I know Hmm. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. There's something I wanted to say about. Well, yeah. I mean, I think. Um. I'm going to kind of just jump all over the place because that's where my mind is at right now with um, kind of in my studio and yeah, just because. So how do we get here? Hmm. Ah, here, this is what I wanted to show you. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one. So <clears throat> yeah, here we go. Um, so in 2021, I, um, I had a show at my gallery in London called Carlos Ishikawa. 
And she, um, my goddess, she asked me many years ago, you know, at the beginning of my career, I would say kind of just as I was moving out of the club and into the art world, um, I was performing at the time with my longtime friend and collaborator, Cora Crit Arunanshai. And Vanessa, um, yeah, she asked me to do a show with her. And I, it took me many years to kind of not free myself, but to kind of give myself permission to break free of um, the performance. So I started as Boy Child. And a few years ago, starting with this show, or maybe, maybe it was the other, other show, but I, I kind of, a few years ago, I, I started to want to really move into my practice um, outside of the, 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 outside of the performance and, and the, particularly the character that people were likening to my practice as boy child. Um, I think like if you recall the the photos that I showed you in the beginning, so something like um, you know these ones, yeah. or this one, or no, sorry, this one. So like in the beginning, really using like a lot of makeup and a lot of of paint, and and. I think, um, yeah, I think people were, were very, um, how do I say it? I would say that like, hmm, sorry, it's quite difficult for me still to really like understand even myself enough to, to, to communicate the ways in which photography and my performance practice um, connect because they're actually they're very they're very entangled in the sense that when I started performing um as I mentioned before I was performing as boy child I was for already maybe 10 years taking photographs um and when and when I and when I went on stage this moment's like very important to me because it it kind of it kind of like shattered my photographic practice in a sense because it it really like my experience of being on stage was is one of um the total present as opposed to one of um I would say lo like looking if that makes any sense because when you take a photograph um especially if you're using uh like not your phone or an automatic camera but that there's always there's these like there's the language and mechanisms of like taking a photo capturing something capturing your subject um and, and like and like looking in the gaze and um for me it, it really the enclosure of the frame um I felt somehow like at that point when I started performing quite debilitated by that. And so, yeah, so per performance really allowed me to be like free in this other space that I can only connect it by its total, um, like not even opposition, but it, it's like, it, it, it's, it's rupture of everything that was photography for me. Um, and and then uh, there's this phrase that I I have been thinking about a lot, which is like everything that you will reject will will come back to haunt you. And I I feel like this momentary freedom from photography, from its enclosure, um, from its fixity, maybe that I had in performance started to haunt me because I was starting to come up against um you know after a few years once I moved out of the club into more uh formal art spaces um the problem 
if you will. I I I was ha I was like, having a problem with it. The the problem of documentation and and archiving and and so I would say like this is this is how I kind of arrived at the drawings. Um, was 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 actually maybe I should go to the drawings first. Sorry, sorry. What is time? Um, drawing. Open with easy. Yeah, so here's some examples of the drawings. Um, so I was really thinking more about like, how can I document my work that is not photographic? Um, the photography I felt was just like flattening everything about the experience of being in the room together, uh, which is in my opinion, one of the most special things about performance. So I was really trying to like get around this problem, photography, this thing that I was kind of not running away from, but really not re addressing in my practice. Um, and uh, I was kind of thinking about, I was kind of thinking about the remnants of the stages that I was performing on, covered in body paint, and the traces of the marks that were left. Um, I was not at the time in a position to kind of like take a stage up for my archival purposes. Not that I would want to do that anyways, but I, I was, I really started to think about the traces of movement, thinking about memory and thinking like how, how, how can, how can the performance live on in a way that's not flattened by an image? One way that I dealt with it is performance drawing. So thinking through, um, I mean, I, I would say that references for me that are very obvious are uh, Trisha Brown's drawings. Carly Schneeman has a performance where she really traces her movements. Um, David Hammond's Body Prince, who is working through Eve Klein. Um, and there are also lots of other people who do body prints. Uh, some of Julie Moretu's early work, she also like has some really cool things where she, there's like the, the remnants of the body and its limits. And um, I, I'd like to mention, I don't know, I really like to mention my lin like lineages because, because we all exist in them. Um, but so, so yeah, one way of dealing with the problem of photography was to make the drawings. Another was to work collaboratively with filmmakers. So that's where um, my collaboration with Wu Sang comes in and my collaboration with Korka Awanunshai, who I worked with for many years, um, thinking about how to translate the performance in film. Um, I don't know if I'll go into that today. Maybe if I have time, we can talk about it. But um, let's see. Boo, 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 boo. Oh, yeah. So to go back to the photographs. <clears throat> Where are they? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we might just have to like hop and skip over the photographs. I don't know that I can totally conceive of them in a direct connection to to performance other than that they're ciphered through me. I don't know. Like, so this show is called, um, what is this show called? Still Lives. What's this show called? Oh, geez. Sorry, guys. It's quite late for me here. Still Lives. I have to look it up. Pardon me. This was a show. So this is a show that I did at Carlos Ishikawa. Still life. 
Oh, Lord. Portrait, still life, and flowers. Ooh, okay. Portrait, still life, and flowers. And um, there are a series of works. Oh, yeah, wait. No, I know how to connect it to the performance. Okay, so it's a series of works that a very small series actually it ended up being 13 works in total uh photographic works and as you can see um they're i don't know if you can see they're basically this is a, a bts one that didn't make it so is this but they're basically photographs of prints that I was actually making to try and conceive of my show. Um, so what does that mean? So basically, I don't know, I kind of like to share this kind of stuff, especially since um, I, I'm talking well to a visual art department and also theater, to people who are making things. Um, so how I arrived at this at this show, was that I was trying to make sense, basically. Don't ever try to make sense of anything. It's just horrible. <laughs> I was trying to make sense of like the thousands of photographs that I've accumulated over the years. Um, so somewhere along the way, I totally abandoned photography when I started performing. And then I don't know, maybe four or five years after I started to photograph again, but very privately. And because my image was circulating so much, um, and because I was, because of the ways in which I could kind of like, I don't know how, to, yeah, navigate this feeling of being like, I don't know, being on stage for me was a way of being, it was totally clear. It was, um, it was somehow free of representation. So like, uh, I actually have a, a pretty hard time with language, with verbal language. It's something that I've kind of taught myself um, through going to school actually to, to talk about my work. And for me, performance was a way to communicate clearly without language so without verbal language or without photographs which um deal heavily with representation because you are you know in many ways representing a moment that I think especially the way that I was taking photographs photographs can very much be a portal but they can also be uh I, I often think about photographs as 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 being dead. I think a lot about death when I think about photographs um, because of the the beginnings. Like a lot of the, I think the first photographs were of that were of of human subjects were dead people, and I also think about the history of it, um, photojournalism, and this kind of the moment is not living and I think that there are a lot of people whose work totally contradict that but I, I would say that my relationship to photography is one that really thinks about and thinks through death fixity something that is like not live in the way that maybe performance is live um nevertheless I have accumulated as many of us have thousands and thousands and thousands of digital photographs, but also hundreds, if not thousands of film photographs. And with this show in 2021, um, I was thinking a lot about the pandemic and thinking a lot about death. Um, and, and, and thinking about the medium of photography, 
I was thinking a lot about still lifes and also thinking about how the value of life at the time, especially, um, it became very clear, like, I think for me in the pandemic, the ways in which the, the systems that we live in became clear the way in which life is not valued, let's say, um, as opposed to maybe in a time like right now, when, which is not the same as before, but it is really like when we're thinking about progress and going, 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 and constantly doing and making and consuming um, the systems that it, it's just very complicated. So it's, it's like, um, it just felt very, very vivid and, and simple when, when, if everything is shut down and we have only to think about care and, and we're in a place of unknowing. So like in the beginning of COVID, um, and we're really left to ourselves and to our domestic spaces. I, I, I really was just thinking about, and, and as a performer, right. Um, I was, I actually was able to perform in, in various strange capacities, um, but not in the same way. And I was thinking really about the, like more of the domestic space of performance and um I, I yeah I think like for me another thing I'll say about photography is like the still lives of flowers and of bouquets um for me photography and my practice of it is one that likens me to everyone my photographs are like they were at the time like really like bouquets the house my partner, my friends. Um, and um, I, I don't know if this is true, but I, I just, I feel like, like this photograph of the flowers, it, I don't know, I sometimes, I sometimes just feel like I see my photographs everywhere, which is to say that I'm photographing other people's photographs which to me speaks of like a shared impulse of capture and and I won't speak on behalf of other people obviously but for me I, I was really just trying to like having to deal with these photos was having to deal with like the accumulation of an impulse to capture the impulse to want to hold on to something that is um, quite utterly impossible. So in that sense, it, it really, I don't know, it's not that it's just about failure, but it, it is in many ways, I think like a failure of everything that, um, I can do in performance, which is like live and present. And so I photographed these works um, that were printed out on really cheaply. They're actually, I mean, at the end it started to accumulate, but like cheaply, I got them done at the like corner shop in New York um, where I was at the time, um, 11 by 17 prints. And uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's all I'll say about these. Um, yeah, maybe actually I'll say one more thing, which is the the I was really tore up about showing these because I was just like, oh God, these photos, I have these photos. Like, what are these photos? I hate these photos. Um, but I have so many of these photos. <laughs> and my gallerist was really like, I was saying like, this is what I'm doing. This I'm trying to like think about these things. And then she was like, these are the works, um, which was really cool because, um, I don't know, sometimes it's like really helpful to have other people just kind of like help you to see and understand what you're doing, um, which is like another really cool thing about school. So I don't know if everyone in, in who's gonna watch this is in school or has gone to school. I only recently went to school in 2018, 
but I think it's a really valuable space to do this kind of like talking and reflecting. Okay, so hmm, what time is it? Is it two? Okay, so eight minutes. Maybe I'll show something else. What else should I show? Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. This one, that'll go see. Um, oh, actually, you know what? Sorry, I'll just share. Oh, yeah, I'm going to share. Um, I'm going to share one more thing from the photo show and then uh, uh, it's and then I'll maybe show something from a performance. Yeah, that's what I'll do. So this is the, the audio. <clears throat> that was actually the 14th piece in the photo show. And um, I'll share it because I would say like, now that I've kind of crossed over publicly into, I don't know, I don't, I don't see them as being separate, but they, they are oftentimes navigated as separate spaces. Now that I've crossed into maybe a more visual art practice, right? So where I have not me in a space dancing around, but a work that I've done that might reflect me dancing around on the wall, so like a drawing. Um, uh, I don't know. Somehow I feel like I, I always try to, in one way or another, um, add another dimensionality to the work. So if, if, it, if it's two dimensional, if there are photos on the wall, if there are drawings on the wall or drawings on the floor, I, I tend to try to use either video or sound um, to break the visual field somehow. I don't know if it's successful, but I thought I would just share the sound piece that accompanied the, the photos for you real quick. Okay, here you go. I like the way that photos show you the different ways of seeing. The mechanisms of seeing are embedded in the apparatus of the camera. And there is much to learn about the bending to be done in the way we see. There is death and a still life. And there are angels sleeping in beds. And there is the infinite desire of capture folded into each moment. And I long to be okay with death. And I long to hold every moment with me in my pocket. But instead these moments sift in and out, dancing and disappearing and reappearing like electrons in an atom coming in and out of focus. Our memory is a stack of photos and everything is touching, rubbing into everything else. These photos show me this. These photos show me how wrapped up my desire is with capture. These photos show me how human I am. These photos show me the fallacy of seeing and the falsity of self. These photos show me my own entrapment These photos show me love. These photos show me the many windows and frames. These photos remind me that God is change. And the beauty of the lilt, wilt, and tilt of passing time. I learned the stage from the frame. 
Life is pressed between seeing and performing. Photography taught me seeing in the frame. Photography taught me that the frame and the stage are one. Photography brought me performance. Performance lenses life so you can see and reflect. The interconnectedness feels beyond explanation and yet too tangled to ignore. Um, I hope people could hear that. That was quite quiet for me, but um, okay, wait, I only have two minutes. Mm -hmm. What should we see? What should we look at? Um, huh. oh. Well, actually, maybe I'll just wrap it up there because I don't know if I have enough time. I quite, uh, I like to uh, blah, blah, quite a bit about each thing. So um, I'm going to stop sharing and <clears throat> should we do a Q and A now? Um, thanks. Thank you, Tosh. That was really deep and widespread and really beautiful to look at. So there's a lot you're working with across a lot of different forms. So I, I, there are a lot of uh, things to ask about. I hope people on the um, live stream would offer some questions on uh, in the YouTube chat box if you are with us there. I'm looking for that window here. So please uh, try and, oh, I say I'm unable to connect to chat. There's so many levels to this all the time. Um, in the meantime, though, I thought, you know, I, of course, have a million questions, but I wanted to congratulate you on all of this work, but the pieces I haven't seen are really exciting to see. And, but the thing that, of course, sticks in my head is this comment from Vaginal Davis and the shame around that um, <laughs> of interpretive dance. And, you know, you really grappled with, like, interpretation as an artist through photography and a lot of other uh, forms here. Um, but, like, interpretive dance was, like, some kind of joke when I was a kid or something, like, some kind of, like, corny thing to do or something like that. But, what, like, what are the associations you have in it? And now I'm thinking, well, what's so wrong with interpretive dance, you know? Um, I share those corny interpret, um, like, I share that feeling about it. Um, interpretive dance, yeah, I don't know. When she said it, I think I also just had, like, I had this like my my aunt's voice in my head, like teasing me about interpretive dance, or like not even me, but like teasing something culturally about interpretive dance is always like the worst thing you could do. <laughs> it's like interpretive dance, um, and I don't come from I don't come from um, an upbringing like where art or dance or theater were a part of that. So like it was just kind of this trope of like really bad performance, maybe even in pop culture, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and in, in a bad music video. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that like the further I go down this road of uh, improvisational movement-based performances, um, that I don't know that I would say that I interpret things, maybe I do, but it's, Maybe I do interpret things, but that it's it's just um it's kind of just a mechanism of of translation for me, which uh I find valuable because I don't know, I, I consistently find myself like locked out of like language or something. Like I find like the boxes of things. Um I feel like I'm constantly rubbing up against the edges of like what a language is or what what a visual language is and so I don't know for me doing something like interpretive dance allows me to be free of that box 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thank you. I think it's Paolo's manning the 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 liminal space between the YouTube and the Zoom. Maybe we can Paolo. some uh, management of the crossroads. Can I ask you one one more little question yeah. um, about the? You know, there's so many different ways in here. But of course, I'm always concerned with like the theatrical and thinking about coming up both in drag, which can be like all the way to like camp ridiculous and theatrical. Um, and then the kind of, I don't know, the dance piece you showed us, the movement piece in the museum lobby just has this really kind of beautiful finish to it around light and costume that I associate a little more leaning towards theater, you know, like a touch of theater to it than a kind of minimalist performance tradition, you know. Um, so I'm curious, like, what parts of like theatricality are really important for you? Because I don't think all of your work is like about being theatrical, but I think there's some strains there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I now experience the world through performance. And I think theatricality is, is um, a flourish to performance that is quite specific. Theater history, um, as wide and encompassing as that is, has a lot of... Um, yeah, I think like when you think about a theater, you, you, I personally think about kind of like an audience and a stage. Um, and I guess with, with drag being at the core of that theatricality, if I, if I experience the world through a lens of performance, theatricality, I, I'm thinking about it in even the most mundane ways. Um, I would say like, I'm glad I shared that performance because for me, it really, it, it has the same aspects um, of like a minimal performance. It, it's really a lighting, sound, a costume and a hairpiece in movement. Um, and, but, 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 and, and also those things are quite evasive. So I think like in some sense, it may be for performance art, it is quite theatrical, but within theater, it, it totally lacks like narrative structure. And, you know, theater, I'm understanding, especially German speaking theater, they love like an eight hour play. So th that kind of time could sit in a tradition of it, but there's no beginning and end. And even like the stage conceptualized as a beginning and end, the movements um, really break that. <laughs> Like I was like, okay, Josh, we're gonna start at this end and go back because it's like time, like in the thing. And he was like, okay. And then after like twenty minutes, he was just like, I can't do the like, <laughs> like I for, for five hours moved backwards, without ever looking into the light because I was really trying to think about what it means. Um, I was thinking a lot about obscurity, and like, um, you know, like Buisson's right to be obscure, like like the thinking about visibility and and what can be said outside of the what can be seen. Um, I also would say that there's a thing that it, it's not just theatrical, but there's like uh the photos are quite beautiful, but for me, beauty is an entry point for a lot of things because um Actually, uh, there's actually a question here at the beginning that says, I can only imagine how difficult it could be to explain, uh, be to explain, but I'm curious if you could give us some insights to how it felt, to how it felt to perform for three to five hours, how it felt physically, mentally, and emotionally. Um, that's from Jess PG. And so um, the beauty, whatever that means, like, is a way for me to kind of enter more intense, visceral, cathartic states for an audience. So it's like the, the beauty and the terror thing. I think that to really understand beauty, one also has to know terror and 
maybe it's theatricality, but I think there's something about that's like notions of beauty through theatricality that I'm employing. If that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a question here about making the drawings. Are the drawings a result of a dance with materials or are they a part of planning? Oh, um, yes. Um, yeah, okay, so sorry, I didn't answer the question about what it feels like to perform for 35 hours. Oh, well, it feels, yeah, it feels- I, I sort of heard an answer in there, but say more. The, the, I don't know. We all have bodies if we're here, but I also think that the body and the body is something that I I work through is my, I work through my body, but I I also think that bodies are really um, far more expansive and limited, you know. Like, and, and when I perform, I actually if by using my body, I I kind of feel like I lose my body it no longer becomes this like enclosed thing or even this like porous thing it becomes like fully obliterated um so that's what it feels like to perform for that long is total uh obliteration of the body in um with josh and with ashlyn the two other the performers josh is the dancer and ashlyn is a person doing music and I would say also like with the space and with the other people in the room there's this uh this feeling that there's no like um Denise Ferrero de Silva uses this um uses this word from a physicist called plenum so it's thinking about like if in physics you no matter how small you go, uh, you know, when you get down to atoms, the electrons are dancing and the neutrons are dancing. So there's this kind of like energetic, like if there's a physicist in the room, help me out here. But like basically that at the most basic principles of the existence of how we can understand the world, there are no boundaries that are fixed. So there's kind of just this like vibrational thing. And the text that that comes from is um, on difference without separability. And I don't know, that's how I experience it. Mentally, emotionally, physically. Yeah, the body, mentally, emotionally thing that goes away when the body goes away. Yeah. Um, I don't have a preference of pronouns. I'm, I kind of like the conventional ones, I suppose, because I'm controversial like that. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can use other pronouns, I guess. Maria Matudakis of making the drawings. Are the drawings a result of dance, of a dance with materials, or are they part of planning? Oh, that's a cool question. They are um, a result of a dance. They are transcriptions of a dance. And for me, they, uh, I don't know, I was trying to explain this maybe, and I don't know if I was very clear at all in that whole hour of talking, but um, I started to make the drawings because I didn't want photographs or videos anymore of my performance. I wanted to kind of, I wanted to see my own performance, which is absolutely impossible. Um, but what came of it is, is this drawing practice. So thinking about a gesture, which for me, a gesture oftentimes when I'm performing is, is really thinking about a text. Like one of the first performances that I did with Wu, she would read something, a line of a text and I would dance it. So it would be like a literal, like one-to-one -one translation. The one-to-one -one were of course, like a poetic sentence and a poetic dance. But the drawings are actually kind of like taking that one step further. So um, what is the feeling of the gesture? What does it look like to me? And the drawings are what the dance looks and feels like to me, if, if that makes sense. Um, so they are more, 
a result but they're also for me like the thing that I love most about the drawings is um and now the paintings is getting to think and this is why I I always return to performance seeing the drawings is a way for me to think more about the movement thinking about layering movement because if I if I do this gesture if I do a hand dance it lives on infinitely through memory, but it also um, somehow like seeing the traces of it, I, I, it gives me kind of a language, a poetic language to, to continue to, to think about movement. Um, okay. Studio, Paul. <gasps> oh, hey. Hi, Paul. And moving from nightlife to grad school and into institutional context, how have you negotiated maintaining the vitality of those spaces as context shifts? Have you had to compromise? Oh boy, yeah. Or do you find yourself expanding the boundaries of what, for example, Gropius Bao can imagine? Wow, that's such a cool question. I am so happy to see your name. Um. Vitality is such a cool word. Uh, wait, Malik, Jose, Jose wrote a thing on Ana Mendieta called Vitality and the Afterburn. Do you know? That that seems plausible. I can't remember. Right. <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure if you knew. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's like somehow the improvisational thing and the performance thing, it's like the shape of my symbolic heart, <laughs> which is like um, really thinking about staying present. Uh, it's a difficult thing to negotiate. I have to say like, as I get older and as, and even not even as I got older, but as I really, with it, with, in the first couple of years of performing, I learned performance by doing performance. So at the time I was working in a restaurant, taking photographs, being a young queer person, living my life. And then I started performing and I started like pouring everything into performance. Um, and I, I, I calculated this once, I think in the first couple of years, of performance, uh, performing in the clubs, I, I was, I think I performed like a couple hundred times in the, in the first like three years. And that was because I was literally taking every opportunity I could to be on stage. Um, and it was where I found community. And it was where I, I was able to really like toy with the limits of my burgeoning identity as a queer person and, 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 um, playing with and thinking with like other people about what was possible politically or um, within the community of like of care and and living housing and um, that was really wonderful and then as I started to as it became my career and I went on tour with at the time let's see I think it was like one or two years into performing with um, Mickey Blanco, who's an amazing artist on tour. It just meant performing even more again, but in, in more expanded nightlife contexts. And it actually, it kind of killed the nightlife for me somehow. It like, it turned the thing that was so vital into a job. And I don't know it's a difficult thing to negotiate, but I just try to like really be true to um, I don't know the present moment, if that makes sense. Like, I think I often think about the architecture of a space that I'm, I'm working in. I also think about the invitation. Um, so if I'm performing at a conference or a festival or you know, like the Martin Gropius bow for as a great example. 
I changed the length of performance because the first time that I performed was before the pandemic had started that we were aware of. It was in kind of the tail end to the middle of winter in Berlin. So people start to get a little like, I don't know if anyone's ever been to Berlin, but it just gets kind of like the winter. And then, um, and also the entire space was clear. So the entire museum, museum was empty. And Berlin is a city where I performed enough times that I know that people will really show up for um, several hours to something. And so five hours made a lot of sense. The second time I did it, it was 2022. There was a huge Louise Bourgeois opening and also a group show. So I, and it was like maybe art week. So um, I just would, I was really thinking about who's going to come, how they're going to arrive and like the logistics of it even like, will they have time to actually sit here for an hour? It was also in the fall. So like, you know, coming out, out of summer and going into winter, what are people's capacity to sit in space right now? Like, does it serve anyone to do something for five hours? Will anyone be able to, um, because as a as a person who makes performances, I I really totally know how difficult it is to sit through a performance. Um, so I I try to be really generous, and 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 thoughtful to like what an experience of many different kinds of people might be, to sit and watch the thing I make. Um, have I had a compromise? Absolutely, you always got to compromise. I think in certain weird ways but also maybe not. Sorry, that's a good question. It's hard to answer. Vitalism, atherburn, the sense of onomendieta. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe with the compromise process in mind, would you say anything else about the museum show that you're working on right now? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Hmm. Yeah, I feel pretty like, I don't even know if I can talk about it. I, I am, so I mentioned the paintings. I don't know why I feel so, <laughs> it's taken me many years to show like these, uh, you know, visual arts, like non-performance works. I, I don't know, I think maybe because there's like, well, I have such a clarity um, even though there's like maybe no control or something, there's like such a crisp clarity that I can achieve when I'm performing. And I really love that it like requires being in the same room, you know, we're like breathing the same air, it's the same day in the same city. And for whatever reasons, we're in this place together. You know, there's this like clarity that whether you like it or dislike it, I know that we share something. When there's something on the wall, you just leave it there. You just leave the thing there. People come and go, they can revisit it. Um, so I have this really, I have a difficult time talking about it, but yeah, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to think about, this one's a lot about scene and um actually the things I talked about a bit were, were uh, things that I'm thinking about so I think one floor will be photos and one floor will be I think paintings the bottom floor and I'm conceiving it as kind of thinking about one as the sky the photos and one as the ocean and this very work in progress, but I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking about the sky. There's the <laughs> there's like a a myth that now that I've worked in theater for uh, three and a half years, I, I kind of have this newfound respect for myths. Or we did Orpheus, um, for example, and the way they uphold belief systems. 
Um, so there's this myth about the sky that it reflects the ocean. And there's this myth about the ocean that it reflects the sky. But um, I don't know, somehow the, the drawings are the, or the paintings are the ocean and the photos are the sky. Thinking about the way that blue moves. I use a lot of blue in my, in my drawings. Um, and I think a lot about blue, you know, starting with Eve Klein, thinking about Gwen Ligon, the, like the, um, the like blue has quite a striking history in painting um, and visual art. Um, and also blue, like the way that it basically in the sky, the reason we see blue is because blue scatters more efficiently, the blue light scatters more efficiently than the wedgy bit. So like everything, all the other colors. And thinking about the bottom floor and the ocean, the ocean is blue because the water actually absorbs all other colors. And blue, I mean, it's quite similar, but it moves the furthest through the water as well. So it's one of, it's kind of like thinking about the photos as like the scattering or the proliferation of these like notions of seeing and thinking about the performative works, the transcriptions of the performance as this kind of like, you know, like, uh, cause I, when I think about the photos, I think about the scattering of like, my eyes, my vision, my sight, the things I see through these like notions of seeing. And then when I think about performance, I think about body and what my body holds and how to, um, kind of re-communicate and process everything that my body is like, um, absorbing. And, and that's also just to think about the, the everything that our, our, all of our bodies are absorbing. Um, that's as far as I think I can talk about it right now. Yeah. That, that's beautiful. <laughs> it sounds like a great way to say I love you. I love the way you conceive of how to use the space. Um, sounds like yeah. a good start. See how it happens. Um, well, I just want to thank you for spending this nighttime, this Swiss nighttime moment with us uh, here in San Diego, where it's sunny, <laughs> but not yet warm. It's still cold. We're having a very cold California winter. Okay. But uh, thank you for warming up our <laughs> day with your uh, artist talk. Thank you so much, Taj. Yes, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I really appreciate it. All right. All right. Thanks for Bye. joining us. See you later. Thank you. Take care.